the world's water supply is clearly a, a critical topic. We know enough about the details to have a fairly good idea as to just how finite it really is. It's our big blue marble and we are going to have to take better care of it. Sadly, our supply is disappearing far too quickly for our own good. It isn't the amount of water that exists. We pretty well nailed down the details on that. What we're losing is the supply that we humans can use. And we're doing this to ourselves. There's a lot of water, in a way, in our global ecosystem. Yet there really isn't enough to go around when we start looking for what we need and how we can fulfill our needs. Starting off right, requires that we look at a bit of a paradox. This is a terrific example of a model that you can pass to anyone with instant understanding. It's entertaining, but it's remarkably accurate. Anyone, I think, recognizes an orange. You've probably noticed there are a lot of bumps and grinds on the surface. Try this for the scale model. Believe me, it works. I've done the arithmetic, and I suspect you'll do it yourself someday if you consider using it as an example for someone else. The distance from the top of the highest bump to the bottom of the deepest grind on that orange can be compared to the diameter of the orange, the size of the orange. And it will turn out that it's just about the same ratio as if one were to compare the distance from the top of the highest mountain to the bottom of the deepest oceanic trench of our Earth to the size or diameter of the Earth. That makes every single old orange sitting around in your fruit basket a perfectly good scale model of the Earth's mountains, valleys, and oceanic trenches. It works. The visual impact is hard to accept, and the reason is because we have a mental image of the size of the ocean, how much it is, how big it is. The horror of a tsunami is a great way to call that into your mind very quickly. The Andes, the Alps, Himalayas, it doesn't matter, are really mountainous. But the globe is a lot bigger than we usually take into account. To scale, the ocean's depths and mountain's tops are fully within a very thin skin. We have something like 1.5 billion cubic kilometers of water on this planet. We know some things. 97% or close to that is marine, salty. Not easy to use. A little bit less than 3% is fresh water. Unfortunately, of that less than 3%, which is fresh water, 2.4% is not accessible. That is to say, rational people don't think you can get at it and use it. The reason? It's invested in glaciers, polar caps before we melt them, and groundwater that's extraordinarily deep, and 2,500 feet is a bit of a, an arbitrary limit, but that's a very deep well. 99.4% is just not available to us. Of what's left, 0.3% is lakes, streams, the atmosphere, soil, and groundwater that isn't quite so deep. Those two, a very small portion of the total water on Earth, are our source. Oddly enough, we use the 0.3% in groundwater more 
for our purposes in industry, in agriculture, and even in our homes. You think of fresh water, you think of a lake. Perhaps you'd be thinking of a well. The water below us, the water in the ground, is referred to as water in aquifers. Trouble is, there's less water than we think, no matter where we find it. There's some fresh water in the lower left picture. Of course, that happens to be a highway, which happens to be just to the left of the Raritan River, which happens to overflow frequently. That's a lot of fresh water, but it isn't really accessible. You simply cannot go out there and capture it. It can get out of its way, which is, of course, what we naturally will do, but you can't really refer to it as accessible. Not in terms of human use. It's a timing problem. Timing can be overwhelming, especially in terms of the water we need. Timing isn't really the only problem that's built in. Precipitation also presents a distribution problem. Not timing, not distribution, both. This is here just so you can take a look for a moment, stop, pause. Consider where the water tends to be. You'll notice that the, the blue and purple areas are around the equator. That's where most of the water hits. This reflects the positioning of major components of our atmosphere, the Hadley cells. Take a look also at uh, where it's driest, the maroon and red areas. It's not surprising that the central part of Australia is dry, nor is it surprising that the Sahara is dry, or that Saudi Arabia is dry, or even that the steppes of Central Asia, the Gobi Desert, major portion of the northern part of Asia is dry. But look at us, look at the U.S. It's dry in a major part of our country. It is, in fact, desert. We don't think of it that way. You might be able to get someone to say, well, of course there are deserts in Nevada or in Arizona, but guess what? Those deserts go all the way up through Canada. Half the country is short of water. And it's a critical half, because it happens to fall right where we do most of our agricultural production. If you look, the red and maroon areas cover what we often call the breadbasket of the U.S. Of course, we also call it the Dust Bowl. But it is nevertheless where most of the huge industrial-sized agricultural activity in the U.S. occurs. This produces a major portion of our export. We're very good at it. It uses an enormous amount of water, but the water is not coming from precipitation. Much of it is coming from the ground, from one enormous aquifer called the Oglala. This aquifer, which in many places is literally drying up, is essentially fossil water. It's not being replenished. It was put there through eons. A little bit here, a little bit there. Accumulates. When you pull it out in great quantity, the amount becomes less and less each year. Even at that, the Oglala is the biggest single piece of fresh water in the world. So we have some time to pay attention and treat it a bit better than we have been. We will eventually be much more careful. The trouble is, the longer we wait, the more damage we can do. 
and that damage can very well be permanent. The replenishment of a fossil supply like the Oglala is limited. Fortunately for us, there's fair replenishment each year, but we still take out more than is put back by nature. Make it personal. Is it your fault? My fault? Or the guy behind the tree? A few years ago, the state of New Jersey declared an emergency. We were running out of available water. It wasn't that the water was gone. We are very fortunate in the Northeast that there is sufficient water for our needs, but we don't manage it particularly well. The state declared that 50 gallons per person was sufficient and should be the goal. Fine. I thought it was quite a limited goal. I was wrong. It wasn't that hard to achieve. I was told by colleagues that, in fact, 100 gallons was not at all unusual for a normal consumption rate, and that something like 150 was as much as you could reasonably blame somebody for using, if they were a little careless. But there was one other number that got thrown into the pot that surprised me. Every day, each of us can be blamed for something in the order of 1,500 gallons or more of water use. That surprisingly large number reflects the amount of water that is used anywhere for our needs. That means the water used by industry, by agriculture. Not just what you drink, not just what you use to clean things like yourself, but everything you use. Each of us uses a great deal more water than we actually take consciously into account. I'd like to end this particular path because it's gotten long enough. This supply, Big Blue Marble pathway, leads directly to a second. Some of these paths are closer than others. This is particularly a pair that probably enhance each other in terms of understanding a so-called big picture. You might take the second step, which would be along the supply global hydrological cycle next. <laughs>